Jimbo Fisher came into Atlanta at SEC Media Days today. He was asked about the Saban stuff a lot, and you got exactly what you thought you would get from Jimbo Fisher talking about the Nick Saban stuff. Now, my favorite quote from him was, Nick and I said some things back and forth, and unfortunately, it went public. I need to remind you, it went public because Jimbo Fisher called a press conference the next day uh, with the express intent to make it public. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm having fun with it. Settle down. I'm having fun with it. What I am saying, though, is if you didn't think those guys were going to have this ironed out by the time you got to Atlanta two months later, then you were crazy. Uh, they had that taken care of. And even if they didn't have it taken care of, they knew it serves no purpose for us to continue this. We're not going to give them the satisfaction. And they're not going to give you the satisfaction. They may hate each other behind the scenes, uh, but they're not going to let you know about it anymore. However, what I did like and what I noticed is he did, he being Jimbo Fisher, he did go back to the same theme that we talked about on Late Kick the night after that happened. And that is, look, we want the same thing. Nick, Nick Saban tonight, we want the same thing. We just want uniformity. Uh, at, at that night, they both called for federal help. And, you know, whereas I maybe haven't gone that far, because I know what that means, they're singing from the same hymnal. That's twice in as many days as we've said that on this show, but they're singing from the same hymnal. They want the same thing a lot of these coaches do. It was a theme on and off the record all week. I mean, as, as Harson was walking into our room earlier today, there were rumors and news about new legislation that's being passed from the NCAA, and coaches didn't even know. And so they're looking around saying, hold on, what does that mean? What's that going to mean for, for rosters at this point of the year and that point of the year? That's how they all sound. That's what's aggravating so many head coaches. This is a group of folks who need to control. That's not just a college thing, man. That, that's, that's an every level thing. The coaches are the most comfortable when they control things. They don't control the outcome of the game, but if they control the structure of the practice to get the players that they recruited ready to play the game that they are on the sideline for, that's control to them. When people or entities are throwing things at them that they don't control, or when they're having to operate in a world where they don't even know what the rules are going to say 12 months from now, that's not control. And they're not experts in the NIL field. They're not experts in the conference realignment field. That's what aggravates a lot of them. So Jimbo pretty much sounded like everyone else, albeit speaking a little bit faster when talking about that today. But he also talked about his quarterback position, did Jimbo Fisher? And yeah, he mentioned Haynes King. And he mentioned Max Johnson, but he circled right back to something that he said on our show on National Signing Day. And that is, I think I have the best freshman quarterback in the country in Connor Wegman. Remember, I asked him several months ago, why didn't you get more involved in the Quinn Ewer sweepstakes? Texas ended up getting him. Maybe it wouldn't have changed if A&M was in it, but A&M was never even in it. He said, we didn't get in it because I thought we had the best guy in the country in Connor Wegman. And he included Ewers in that, even though Ewers is technically not a true freshman. Pay attention to that. I know that everybody, including myself, honestly, everybody's looking at that quarterback battle, and it's an A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. It may very well play out that way. Or it may be that neither one of those guys totally takes the job by the throat, and Jimbo Fisher keeps looking over there at the guy running with the threes, and all of a sudden that guy's running with the twos, or at least getting some reps with the twos, and then he gets some reps with the ones, and first thing you know, they're struggling in a game, or maybe someone gets nicked up, and Connor Wegman's in there a lot sooner than you ever thought he would be. The other thing, here's the theme I have picked up on, talking to coaches uh, behind the scenes about Texas A&M, a couple of personnel folks too. The phrase, get them early, keeps getting said. It's what they said about Bama last year, get them early. And the reason they're saying that about A&M it's because they know there's a little uncertainty at quarterback. I, I don't think it's doubt, but it is uncertainty. They understand there are a lot of young pieces that are going to be integral to their overall success. Think of Evan Stewart, for example, at wide receiver. And they know the team that you see in September, the team that plays Miami in week three, for example, is going to be a far cry from the team that plays LSU at the end of the year. Now, if that team playing LSU already has two or more losses, they're not on the playoff radar. They're probably not on the SEC championship radar. But if they only have one loss... Maybe it's to Alabama, you know, maybe they're not, maybe they're behind the Crimson Tide and they're not vying for the SEC Western Division title, but you and I both know, you got one loss in the SEC West and it's to Bama, doesn't matter if you go to Atlanta, you're probably still in the college football playoff conversation. And at that point, a lot of those freshmen are really no longer freshmen anymore. At that point, you, for better or for worse, in this case better, you've got quarterback figured out already. A lot of folks want to get A&M early. They want to play them early, but they want to make sure they bite them a couple times early because they don't want to see that roster given time to gel, and they don't want to see what could be that machine in 2022 come together. 